they give off a glare and you can't see anything. Brad, let me know when I'm good to start. All right, let's uh, so like we had, we, let's wait until the, the counter slows down a bit and then we'll, and then you can start. Absolutely. We have someone commenting, Meg, hello from Texas. There we go. Hey, Meg. Got to ask you about Brady leaving. Is that a trauma in Boston? That's a so, sore subject, Frederick. Yeah, Ro I Rob, imagine. you can answer that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we uh, the staff yesterday I uh, dressed up with uh, Patriots and uh, I explicitly, explicitly told everyone no Tom Brady jerseys anymore. Uh, we're still in denial up here. All right, yeah, I, I can, I get that. It's, <laughs> um, it's not, um, Okay, my my brother-in-law lived in Ireland, and all Irishmen are they follow all Boston sports. It's a stereotype, but it's true. Like everyone in Ireland roots for the Boston teams, and they're all upset about it. And they live in <laughs> Ireland, so I can only imagine what it's like in actual Boston. My brother-in-law is he's 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 been. I can't talk to him. My, my sister had to tell me like you can't joke about this, Frederick. It's serious. You can't make jokes about it. You know, you can't you can't text him writing about that because he gets really upset. Yes, yes, this was not the way I wanted to start this webinar, but uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and, but here we are. Uh, here we are. Speaking of Boston, though, and speaking of Irish, I will say, Frederick, that the Boston Celtics won Game Seven last night, and they're moving on. To I the saw. Yes, yes, yes. They're moving on to the Eastern uh, Conference semi uh, Eastern Conference Finals. So good yeah. news there. Um, I think it's uh, it's slowed down. We're still going up, but we're slowed down. So why don't you why don't you get us get us started, Robert? Great. Thanks so much, Brad. Really appreciate it. All right. So folks, um, you're going to unfortunately have to listen to me for three or four minutes, and then we'll get to the good stuff. So just to, you know, good morning, and thanks for being here with us for the next hour to hear from international best-selling author Frederick Bachman. Uh, my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the community outreach librarian and head of technical services. Uh, here at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, I want to make a few quick points uh, before, before turning things over to uh, Joe and Frederick. So first, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes who made this event possible. This is a collaboration between six North of Boston libraries. Uh, I'd like to thank Stephanie from Andover, Lizzie and Sharon from Billerica, Lynn from North Reading, Rebecca from Woburn, and Charlotte, Erin, Emily, and certainly Brad from Wilmington. Uh, I'd also like to thank Ariel from Simon and & Schuster and Jane from Wellesley Books. Uh, second, I uh, just wanted to point out that this event is actually the start of a long series of virtual visits from best-selling authors uh, that the six libraries are hosting. Uh, we already have four author visits booked in September and another four booked in October. Uh, and uh, I'll spare you all the details, but I will note that our next virtual author event is with best-selling author Kyle Mills, and that's next Saturday, September 19th at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Kyle, as you might know, uh, took over for the late Vince Flynn uh, in writing the Mitch Rapp series, which is one of the top three most popular thriller series in the world. So Kyle will be with us uh, a week from today. Uh, third, uh, we are technically sold out for this morning's event, although we did anticipate some no-shows, that, that's what happens. Uh, if you know someone who wanted to attend or you have any Fred Mc, Frederick Bachman fans in your life, uh, please let them know that this event is currently being live streamed on the Wilmington Memorial Library Facebook page. Uh, fourth, uh, you'll all be receiving a feedback survey shortly after this event ends. Uh, please let us know what you thought of today's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Uh, also in the survey will be a link to, a, to um, buy a copy of uh, Anxious People from uh, Wellesley Books, our uh, bookstore partner, who will uh, ship it to you. 
Uh, you have two incentives to do this. Uh, number one, the book is actually autographed by Frederick. And number two, um, the host libraries will receive 15% of each sale. Uh, and then finally, uh, just to set expectations, uh, Frederick and Joe will have a conversation, sort of an interview for roughly 30 to 40 minutes. And then Joe will um, you know, at least ask 10 minutes or so of questions from the audience. Uh, the plan is to wrap up by 11.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A. So we won't be able to see or hear you. So please type your questions into the Q&A function, not the chat function. We'd like all Q&A in the Q&A function. You're happy to chat in the chat function, but questions go in the Q&A function. All right, so finally, let me introduce our two featured guests. Uh, first, our moderator, uh, Joe Golden, is a marketing and content strategist for BookBub, which is an ebook discovery platform. She loves reading, talking about, and attempting to write books, mm -hmm. and she can't get enough of coming-of-age stories and creepy psychological thrillers. Uh, she lives here in Boston with her husband. And finally, our star, uh, Frederick Bachman, is the number one New York Times best-selling author of A Man Called Uva. My grandmother asked me to tell you she's sorry. Britt Marie was here. Bear Town, Us Against You, Things My Son Needs to Know About the World, and uh, two novellas, The Deal of a Lifetime, and, and Every Morning the Way Home Gets Longer and Longer. His books are published in more than 40 countries. Uh, he lives in Stockholm, where it's currently raining, uh, with his wife and two children. So let's all give Joe and Frederick a big virtual round of applause for joining us here this morning. And uh, Joe and Frederick, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm seeing everyone sort of say hi from the chat. It looks like we have people from Texas, Amsterdam, California, a lot of Massachusetts, of course, Oklahoma, really all over. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for um, tuning in. And Frederick, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I'm so thrilled and excited to talk to you today. No, well, thank you for having me. So um, first, oh. No, you go ahead. I was, I was just going to start by saying one of the joys for me of preparing for this interview and sort of reading more about you was learning about um, your journey as a storyteller and sort of what you did before writing novels and sort of like how you've evolved as a storyteller. And to sort of start from the beginning, I'm not sure how many of your readers know this about you, um, but can you talk a little bit about um, what type of writing you did and what type of storytelling you were before publishing books and how you actually first got into publishing your first novel? It depends on how far you want to go back, but uh, um, I, I, I did all sorts of things in my early 20s, uh, did odd jobs, and, and um, I, uh, uh, I studied religion for a while, and I, uh, for a while I was an uh, uh, exterminator for bugs and rats. I worked with that for a while. I worked in restaurants for a while. Uh, I drove, drove a forklift for a while in a warehouse, uh, so I did a, did a couple of different things. And then I, uh, at 25, I decided that I was going to give writing a year. Um, I just had this notion that, you know, maybe I could do make a living from writing. And I said, well, I'll give myself a year and see if I can get get something rolling. And uh, uh, so my friend gave me a job as a forklift driver. I, I worked nights and weekends and that, so I could pay the rent. And uh, that made me uh, able to send emails to magazines and newspapers. This was, this was at a time where there were actually magazines in the world where you could write. Um, everything was not online yet. And uh, uh, I, I said, I'll write for free. I, I sent them emails and they said, uh, you know, no, thank you. You have no experience. You don't seem like you, you know anything about what you're doing. And I said, well, I'll write for free. And they were like, all right, we'll find you something. Uh, and um, so I did that for a while. I did that for uh, that year about, and then 
uh, and then I managed to talk my talk my way into someone giving me a proper job uh, uh, in another city in Stockholm. And I moved, and I was a magazine writer for a while, and uh, and then I played around with ideas for novels, but I didn't know how to write a novel. I, I you know, I, I had this idea that novelists know what they're doing, uh, which turns out nobody has any idea what they're doing. Everyone is just fumbling around in the dark anyway. And then we had our first kid. And um, that's probably when I decided to try and write a novel because that's when I, when we had our first kid, uh, I just realized like there's never gonna be six months for me to like, oh, I'm gonna take this time to write this novel. And up until then I lived in this illusion that a lot of people do that, that, oh, there's gonna be a time for me in my life where my schedule is just magically gonna open up. I'm gonna have six months and I'm just gonna focus on my novel. Uh, and that will never happen. And when we had our first child, that was when that hit me. Like, I'm never gonna have that time that's never gonna be given to me. So if I wanna write a novel, if this is something that I wanna, you know, if, if this is the swing that I wanna take, so to speak, then I have to go for it. I have to find a way to do it now because this is never gonna get easier. Uh, you know, sooner or later, this kid is gonna start talking and, and we're probably gonna have another kid. And, and so I, I figured like, it's now or never. So I wrote it at, at nights, mostly. Uh, the first, I'm Uncle Dubitz. I, I would think 80% of that book is written in the middle of the night uh, while, while rocking the stroller in the living room. Um, uh, and then I work for magazines during the day, and uh, that that's how that book came into existence. Uh, and now I'm here. <laughs> uh, five or six, I guess, many books after that. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, I think for a lot of people, they probably first, um, they first met you in sort of like A Man Called Uva, of course, your first novel, that's how they sort of discovered you. Could you talk a little bit about, I read that the character of Uva um, was inspired by someone that you came across through a blog. Um, I think your coworker had written about. Could you talk a little bit about um, how you created the character of Uva and sort of the inspiration behind that character? Yeah, but it's the same way that it is with all characters. Everyone always asks if, if, if it's, you know, is this character based on a real person? It's the same no matter what what novel I'm talking about, it's always uh, people come back to the characters and they ask, is this character based on a real person? And I always say that it's like, it, it, it's like orange juice. It takes a lot of oranges to make one glass of juice. It takes a lot of pe real people to make one good character. One, one character can be 20, 25 real people uh, and you steal bits and pieces of different people. Um, and, you know, my, my my assumption is that most people that you know, you know, you you don't know a lot of people in your life, um, multi-dimensional, like like deeply. Uh, most people you know, you know one part of them. You know them as a colleague, but you probably don't know them as a parent or as a grandparent or as a neighbor. You only know them as a colleague, and that's one part of them, but that's not all of them. Um, and most people you know are like that. You know them as one aspect of their life, but there are very few. Sorry, my That's sorry, okay. my phone. Uh, my my kids have friends over, and now their parents are calling me. And, um, <laughs> Double uh, duty. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. We have the house full of kids today. Uh, uh, you you were um, you were saying that oh, you sorry, don't. Sorry, where were that? No, that's okay. You were saying that um, you often know people in a one-dimensional way, and that yeah, you know, create, them, yeah. you know, you know, one part of them, and that's uh, so that's what. It, so I mean, Uwe is based on. He's based on a lot of people. Uh, he's based on a you know certain certain type of person that I ran across in, in several, several dif different situations. And I thought that this is, and that character just grew in my head. But, but when you're building a character, 
what I keep coming back to is that I always have more characters to begin with in a story than I need. Uh, I might have 20 characters to begin with and seven when I'm done, but that's because all of the characters that stay characters to me, that don't evolve into persons to me, they, I'll have to take them out. As soon as it's just a character, they, as soon as someone in the story is just there to push the story forward or to, to, to serve one element of the story, I have to take that character out. That's my rule. Uh, they have to be real people to me. I have to know who they are. I have to get them and I have to feel for them and I have to have this sense that I need to, under, to protect them and defend them. Uh, I have to evolve a character into a person that I feel like if a critic writes something bad about me or the story, that's fine. But as soon as a critic goes after one of my characters, I get really annoyed. And that's, that, that's, the, that's my test always. Will I be annoyed if someone talks shit about this character? And, uh, and if so, uh, uh, and if so, then I'm on to something. And that's my um, that's my rule. They have to become characters. They have to become. They, they have to stop being characters. I, I have to feel for them. I, they have to be real human beings to me. Because if they're not real human beings to me, they won't be real human beings to you. That's my that's my only philosophy of writing. Right. Well, that makes sense. If you feel offended on behalf of your characters, it means you have true feeling for them. So. That's interesting to hear how you approach that. Um, I don't know if this is akin to asking a parent if they have a favorite child, but because you have so many lovable characters, I'm wondering, do you have a favorite character from your novels or a character that you most identify with? No, but I have a, I have a favorite child. That's <laughs> it's the child that didn't fight with me in the car okay. from the football practice day. That's, that's the other child, it just... my favorite child today. Um, no, I don't have, um, um, it's, um, no, it, it's, it's an, uh, it's a question you can't, uh, really, that there's no way for me to answer it. I don't have a favorite character. It's the closest, uh, the closest I can get to answering a question like that. It's, I, I, I know Enzo Ferrari, uh, the founder of, uh, Ferrari, the car brand, um, who built sports cars, uh, he was asked at one point or another, what, what is your favorite project? What is your favorite car? And his, his answer was always the next one. And uh, that's, that, that's the only, only answer I can give. If, it's, if, if there's ever a point for me when I feel like it's not the next one uh, and I'm starting, I'm starting to think about you know what I've achieved in the past then I think it's time for me maybe to retire from writing and go find a a normal job uh it's um you have to be obsessed with the next thing you're doing otherwise you're on on the wrong track I think that makes sense uh, so one thing I was excited to talk to you about with anxious people to turn to the book at hand um is the characters and anxious people, uh, because there's a lot of characters, but, and in hearing your process, this makes sense. They all have very singular voices and they're very distinct. Um, and I'm interested to hear a little bit about constructing characters in this novel. And um, if you started with many, it sounds like, and cut them down and sort of like how these voices emerged and um, how you constructed the characters in this novel. But it starts. It starts with thinking a lot. That's what I keep coming back to when when um, when aspiring writers ask for advice. One of the questions that I, that I often get is, "How do you set aside time for writing? What is your writing process? What are your writing habits?" And I always come back to, "I mean, don't worry about don't worry about the writing. Wor worry about the thinking." Uh, because it's not uh, it's not because some people people talk about writer's block and 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 i i can get that to a certain extent but i think some of it sometimes is that people sit down they, you know they early on in my career I, I i trained myself when i was a magazine writer because i figured that maybe this is going to be an issue for me so i trained myself to write anywhere that was an exercise i gave myself so i trained myself 
like I have to be able to write at a bus stop or you know at a at a busy cafe or or you know in the middle of the street I have to be able to shut everything out I have to teach myself how to concentrate anywhere because I was afraid to get to that place that I know a lot of writers do they they you build your perfect little writing cave uh, uh, and you know oh I'm, it's going to be great and I have flowers and there's going to be you know inspirational quotes on the walls and and the lighting is perfect and everything and that's going to be great but you're going to be there for like 30 minutes every three months uh it's not there are so few times that you can put yourself in that position and that's how i i um you know that that's how i go about writing uh that most of the writing is done in your head and then as you sit down you're like oh i, I sit down and, and nothing nothing comes out of the fingers yeah well it's not it's not the fingers doing the writing it's your brain you have to think you have to first you have to live with this story um and figure everything out before you you sit down i think people might sit once in a while i think writers do established writers might do aspiring writers a disservice sometimes by kind of upholding a myth that everything just comes to you. Uh, it doesn't, but you, you have to think. Uh, so what I do, I, I walk around thinking about these characters for a long time. They live in my head for a long time. And usually they, while I'm writing one book, the characters of my next book is, are already living in my head and I play around with things. and that's why the next book feels like it's not work because those characters are still just that's just fun that that can still go anywhere anything is possible while the book i'm writing right now that box is closing in on me and i'm like well i have to i can't do that because that happened and that character can't go there because that i'm you know and i'm i'm closing on the, to the end in the book and so I'll always have one book that I'm writing and maybe one or two or three books that I'm thinking about and playing around with in my head. And um, so the next book is my little vacation project in my head when the writing of this one gets too much. So the characters, anxious people, they might have been living in my head for three years when I started writing the novel. And then, uh, uh, and then they evolve as I'm as I'm starting to work on the story, they evolve because I feel, what would that character do in this particular situation? What kind of, you know, how does this person talk? Because I always try to find little things in a person's way of talking that I can fit into dialogue that hopefully, without making it too obvious, hopefully you'll feel if I'll show you a piece of dialogue and don't tell you who's talking, if you've been reading the novel, hopefully you'll feel, oh, that's the voice of that character and that's the voice of that character because they use different, they, they what do you call it, intonation? Do you call it that yes, in English? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, they'll have, they'll have, they'll emphasize, emphasize different words. They, they use different words. They have, you know, they, they have different grammar, little things um that i can give them to just make them feel real um and i do that with everything i i tell you very little about how people look for example that's right because i'm i'm not very good at it to begin with i i don't describe people well i would make like a horrible horrible witness um my <laughs> wife tells me this all the time because my wife when she asks me like I'm talking about a parent at school or whatever. And she's like, well, what, what, what does she look like? What does he look like? And I can never explain. Like, what was she wearing? I don't know. What were your kid wearing this morning? I have no idea. Uh, if my kid disappears and the uh, police ask me, what was what she wearing? I don't know, clothes. Uh, because these are not the things that, that, that get stuck in my mind. But I do remember like the way someone walked or the way they talked or the way you know, they always have this little thing or a little mannerism they have or a little thing that they keep coming back to or something annoying that they do 
that I noticed that no one else noticed. Uh, the, these are the things, this is how I view people. So that's how I describe them writing. And then hopefully you'll cast them in your head. You'll give them a look. You'll cast them with, you know, with an actor in your head. And that's probably going to make it more real if you do that. And I don't tell you too much about how they look. But I, I, I give them, so I try to tell you, I try to define characters for you by often enough their emotions, uh, their relationships to others. Like what, what are they to other people? How do other people view them? And, uh, and the way they, they talk and little mannerisms. This, these are the things that I try to define people by. That makes if sense. that makes it, sense. It does. And it comes across in your writing. Um, and I hope that you never have to be called to be a witness in hearing your reflections. <laughs> no, I would be, I would be terrible, terrible, terrible. I also don't remember the colors of things. People ask me like the color of a car. I have no idea. Interesting. Um, so in hearing your reflection there and in hearing how you sort of have characters in your mind as you're thinking, as you're writing a current novel and sort of, you know, thinking ahead to those characters or that being sort of your vacation thoughts. Um, can you talk about, I feel like the hook of anxious people in that it's a bank robbery gone wrong is such a distinct catalyst or a distinct event. And I'm, I'm wondering like, where did the first seed of this novel come from? Um, did it start with characters and then you were figuring out a way to get them together? Did it start with that specific event and then pulling characters in? Could you talk a little bit about how this, uh, you know, like the, the very beginnings of this novel? novel started? Um, no, in this particular novel, it started with, I mean, everything to me, every every novel I've ever written, I think starts with, it starts for me with the emotion I would like you to have on the final page of the book. That's, when I start out writing, that's, that, that's my goal, that's my end game, that's where I'm going. I'm, everything I do is to set you up for that emotion that I want you to have for 30 seconds when you close the books after the final page. Uh, because I, I imagine I have 30 seconds of your life right there where we, where it's something intimate, but where it's something, you know, we have a common bond. I told you a story and at the end you close the book and you feel something for 30 seconds and then you're interrupted by, you know, life or whatever or your kids or your pets or something in the street or your phone rings or whatever but we have like 30 seconds and then it's gone then you know you move on to other things um but those 30 seconds are my that's what i i that's what i write for um and uh, so i start with that i usually begin with the characters the characters are the the people in the book are always the most important to me um they i'll build the story around the people not the people around the story that's the only way i know how to write but in this particular case and once in a while i'll get an idea of a premise that's usually you know the premise is is um when i get a premise I might already have a cast of characters. I'll, I'll have this group of characters in my head for a long time, and then I'll get a premise. And I'll say, oh, it would be funny if this cast of characters were in this particular situation, that could work. Uh, and in this case, it was just, I mean, this story is basically three things. It's, um, it's a comedy because I wanted to write a comedy this time around. I had written Bear Town and Us Against You, two more serious dramatic books. And I wanted to write a comedy. Uh, I wanted it to be funny and entertaining. I wanted it to be a relationship drama because everything I do is relationship drama. I could write about an alien bog species that don't even have a language, lives in our planets. I'd still make that a relationship drama. I'd figure th <laughs> something out and it would be, still be about the relationships of the family of bugs. I'm, I'm that, that's, that's just my my theme. It's, I'm always going to come back to that because I'm only interested in relationships and emotions. That's the only thing I care about. And uh, the third thing that I wanted to do with this particular novel was I, I was trying to write a closed room mystery, like a classic locked room or closed room mystery. Um, and as that ended up, then that it, it's 
it's a failed bank robber who runs from the police, runs into an apartment where there's an open house real to viewing going on. Um, the bank robber takes everyone hostage. And you're told in the first couple of books, first couple of pages in the book that this hostage situation will go on for a couple of hours. The police will surround the building and then the bank robber will give up, let everyone go. Uh, but as the police is entering the apartment, the robber is gone. And then the rest of the book is the police interrogating these highly annoying, dysfunctional, anxious people who were hostages, trying to get them to explain what really happened inside the apartment. And that's where, you know, the, 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 the comedy starts to unfold. And um, because these are highly, highly annoying people. And um, because these are the people that I enjoy that I enjoy in life. And um, so, so that, was, that was my goal, that was my, my aim. And you know, the original idea just came from the fact that my wife and I, a couple of years ago, three years ago, we were out looking at new apartments. And so we went to like, I don't know how many apartment viewings, like open houses. And in Sweden, all apartment viewings are always open houses. There's like two dates that you can go and look at each, each apartment. So it's always a bunch of people there. And um, I, I figured out fairly quickly that, oh, I, I don't really care about where we live. You know, I, I, I love my wife dearly, but I don't care where we live as much as she does. So we looked at three apartments and I was like, all of these are fine by me. I, th th these are all good. I can live in either one. And then we looked at like 36 more and I was like, they're all fine. They're all fine. I could live in either one. I don't care. And uh, so I started looking at people instead because whenever we came into an apartment, I'm like, how are we liking this, honey? Do we want to live here? Because, you know, it's fine by me, but how do we feel? And uh, I started looking at people and I had this feeling like everyone is an, your natural enemies at a open house, yeah. your, your competitors. I know everyone is also really anxious. Everyone is, you know, it's a, a very, looking at a new place to live is a very, as a, that's a difficult time in a person's life because you have to ask yourself a lot of questions. Like you have to question your relationship. Like, are we, is this a good step for us? Can we afford this? Is this the neighborhood where we want to live? Is these, are these, you know, is this our identity? Are we comfortable being these kind of people? What are the neighbors like? Do we want to have kids here? Could the kids grow up here? What's the school district like? You know, what, should we live in an apartment? Maybe we should have a house. Are we house people? Are we apartment people? Should, you know, are we ever going to get a pet? What, you know, right. you have all these questions all of a sudden. Everything is on the line all of a sudden, like, because you, you, you see yourself there for five, 10 years, maybe the rest of your life. And I just find, find that, you know, that's a good place to start for me to explore human beings and their dysfunctional relationships. But I also had that feeling when I was walking around, it would be really funny if everyone got locked in here, in this room and everyone had to like coexist. And then I had this idea, like a hostage situation at an open house, that was just funny to me. So that's where it began. And it was funny in the book too. And it, make, it makes sense how you talk about it. It's true that looking for apartments, looking for homes, it sort of cuts to someone's identity. So it's really interesting to hear you talk through that. You talk about how these characters are very dysfunctional uh, and you call them annoying and they, that's what makes them humorous. And also for me, what's made them real. All of their anxieties felt so real to me. Um, and one theme you've continued to explore throughout your writing is mental health, anxiety. And that's, of course, that's really, I would say, central to a lot of your books. But here, you know, it's also at the forefront in naming this anxious people. Can you talk a little bit about exploring anxiety through your stories and why you chose to make it sort of like central in this book? Well, I think it's, I mean, you're, you're touching on it there that it's probably it's a common theme in all of my books. I think I write a lot about anxiety. Um, I mean, it's 
I've never met a really good writer, like someone I, I've never met a creator of anything, like it can be music, art, books, anything that I liked that, that who has created something that I really felt something about who's not anxious. Uh, I mean, all of the people, everyone that I admire, uh, look up to who has created something that I feel something for, like a genuine feeling, um, struggle with, you know, self-esteem and anxiety and all of these things, because people, my, my theory is that people with good self-esteem, people who are balanced and in order and who has their, their shit together, they don't have that need to go explore the inner workings of their emotions they also have, don't have that need to you know to shout something to the world they don't have that need to be like validated um that you do as an anxious person and that's where creativity usually comes from um if you're a, if you're a highly functional human being you don't have that need to be creative because you don't have anything you need to run away from. But creativity is usually an escape from reality. And uh, if you really enjoy reality, you don't have that need to escape from it. And uh, that's why, you know, that's why the most popular kids in school are usually not going to be writers or musicians or, or artists. Uh, that's not, they, they're going to work without different things um, mm -hmm. because they liked reality. They worked in reality. Uh, so, so, you know, it comes from that, it comes from, you know, some, some of it is that I find, it, you know, there's a lot of comedy to be found in anxiety and the way yes. that people deal with it. Um, um, you know, I've struggled a lot with depression. I have a lot of friends who struggle with depression. I mean, suicide is a, common theme in a lot of my writing it's one of those things that keeps coming back in all of my not all of my writing but a lot of my writing touches at suicide at one point or another it's not that i plan out to do it. it's not that i set out to write about it it's just one of those things that keeps coming back and in this in anxious people in particular um that's that's something that comes up in the in the story and uh it's a subject in a man called Uwe. It's a subject in 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 Bear Town, in parts of Bear Town. It's uh, um, uh, it's one of those thing, things that I think uh, keeps coming back. And part of that is that I'm interested in the way that people function. Um, I'm interested in what makes people jackasses and messy messy troublemakers, and and why people fight so much. I'm interested in that and that you have to go find all of these inner workings. But it's also the fact that someone very close to me ended his life when I was 19, 20 years old. And that's almost 20 years ago. And it never ends for me. And it never ends for anyone who's been through that experience. It never ends. There's not, there's not a, a day when you suddenly feel fine about it. It's not. And uh, it, it will never make sense, it will never be logical, and it will define you, a, a part of you, for life. Uh, when someone close to you ends their life, it doesn't matter the circumstances, it will define a part of you forever. And, um, and I'm still working through that, and that's probably why I keep coming back to it in my, in, in my books. And in Anxious People, I wanted to touch on the fact that what you you as a person are connected to far more people than you think so what you do affects other people far more than you have the capacity to understand so when someone ends their life there's threads to so many people and ripple effects um that will go on for years and decades uh, and for the rest of people's lives and i wanted to explore that a little bit as well so it's uh, so that's the that's the drama part there's a comedy part there's a drama part and there's a mystery part of the book and i this this is 
I, I wanted to go all in on each different part. I wanted to make each of the three, three parts stand on their own, so to speak. Well, thank you for writing so honestly and openly about it. Um, it's, I mean, I feel seen in reading your writing because you put so much honesty in how you approach anxiety and mental health. So thank you for that. Um, it really comes across. Um, I could ask you questions all day, but I am looking at the time and I'm seeing that we have a lot of reader questions as well. Um, one that I wanna make sure we get to is one of my last questions for you and Janet wrote in asking this. Um, the first reader question from Janet says, I love your books. What can you tell us about your next book? Uh, it's the third part of, Bear Town, of the Bear Town series. Uh, I'm writing it right now. It's taken a little bit longer than I think people around me wanted to. Um, <laughs> I get a lot of questions about when, it, when is it done, especially for my agent. Um, uh, like, do you have some, is there, is there a time frame here? Uh, but uh, it's the third par part of Bertan. Um, I know Bertan is presented like the Bertan trilogy online in a lot of places. I never said it was gonna be a trilogy. I think my agent at one point or another told the publisher, sure, we'll, you know, we'll let him write three and we'll, we'll stop him there. Uh, but I never said it was going to be three books. I never said it was only going to be three books. I don't know. Um, I don't know how I'm going to feel about that universe when I finish the third book. But I'm writing the third one now. It's the working title is "Those Who Run." Those who run towards the fire. Um, um, that could change. I changed. Anxious people was called open house until halfway through the script, and then I changed it to anxious people. Might change the title here too. I don't know, uh, but there's a there's a general idea that it's going to be published early next year in Scandinavia, so that would mean later later in the year in the U.S. Maybe late like late next year, but that depends if I'm you know if I'm able to finish it in time. Let's see about that. Depends on depends on how much free time my kids give me and. Uh, some other things. Got it. Well, we're excited for that whenever it comes. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone, if you could uh, submit your questions via the Q&A rather than the chat, um, I'm looking through those now. Um, one question that we have from Roberta is, which authors do you enjoy reading? Uh, well, that's a... That's an impossible question for me to answer because I read everything. Uh, it's um, I have uh, a very hard time relating to people who have like one genre or one thing that they or like I have these writers that I, I don't I don't know how to do that. I read everything. Put something in front of me, and I'll read it. Uh, uh, um, I mean, if I if I can. If I can deconstruct the question to a question and I actually can't answer, then then what writer are you most inspired by? That's Astrid Lindgren, who wrote Pippi Longstocking, who's a children, Swedish children's book writer. She wrote Pippi Longstocking, and she wrote a book called uh, The Brothers Lionheart, which is by far the best book I've ever read. I read it at least once a year, uh, which is um, it's an adventure adventure children's book about life and death and good and evil and you know knights and swords and dragons and it's just a perfect adventure uh, it's it, it has everything and um, um, she's the one I'm most inspired by because she was the one I mean first of all because she was my best friend when I was a kid because I read all of her books when I was a kid uh, but she's also this extremely she she could write highbrow lit literature she really could she she was immensely talented but she chose to write in a language that everyone could understand she always chose you know in, no, the, in choice the choice between, between 10, 10 words, words she would also always choose the simplest one uh so that everyone would be included no one would you know miss out on the story because they couldn't understand the words or the language or um the way it was set up and that's what i aspire to i try to use the simplest 
the simplest possible way to tell you the story, the simplest possible words. Uh, and that comes from her. Awesome. Um, I'm just reading through the rest of the questions. We have a lot of great ones here. Sure. Um, one that I want to touch on is from Marcy. She's asking about humor in your stories. And she said, when you write a humorous story, how do you strike the balance between humor and giving the reader a break to laugh and think before getting to the next sharp line? I don't know. It's intuition, I guess. Uh, it's uh, it's a rhythm thing. It's uh, like uh, it's like dancing or or you know songwriting, uh, playing music. It's a rhythm thing. You just have to you have to write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and read what you wrote, and you have to read what others write. And a lot of that is, I mean, a lot of the, um, I try to, I try to explain, like it comes back to the thing that I said, it's more important to think um, than to, you know, don't focus so much on the writing to begin with, focus on the thinking part. Uh, because one of those aspects is when you read something, you want to be a writer, and you read something that makes you laugh, it's good for you to go back and ask yourself, why did I laugh? Like, what did that, what, how did this writer make me laugh? What, how was this constructed so that I would end up laughing? Uh, because if you go, if you go to a stand up show, I have, um, uh, I had a comedian who told me, like, if you go to a stand up show and the comedian makes a joke, and 500 people laugh. There might be three people in there who are able technically to break down that joke and tell you why everybody laughed. Yeah. Like you really break it down and tell you, oh, you see what he did. He did this and then he did this. But what you didn't see is arranged it. And this is, um, it's a rhythm thing. It's an intuition thing, but it's also a part of training. It's a part of looking what other people are doing like how did they go about that what what was it that they did that made me laugh so hard oh they oh they did this or or, or you know and i have um i think i go about in anxious people i go about i go about telling a joke the, the same way i go about telling the mystery and also the same way i go about telling you know making you feel something because it's all a puzzle that I lay down in front of you, and there have I have to play with your assumptions, play with your prejudice, right. and have you looking one way while I rearrange something in the background, so that I can sneak up on you and either sneak up because a joke is that a joke is making you look one way and then sneak up on you because that's what makes you laugh. And solving a mystery is the same. I have to make you look one way and then you smoke some mirrors like you know magician on the stage and then ta -da, have you have a big reveal but it's also the same thing that if i want you to make make you feel something i have to set that up i have to tell you one part of the story and then you know sneak up on you with another part of the story that in combination will make you feel something it's um so there's no manual to it you just have to feel it yourself and uh, uh, and you know and write what's true to you. It's that you know if the greatest piece of advice I've had about writing. Uh, if 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 you're not crying when you're writing it, no one will cry when they read it. That's my only that's my only philosophy. If if you're not feeling everything when you're writing it, then no one else will feel anything on the other hand. It doesn't work like that. It's an extension cord. That's interesting, because as I was reading anxious people and laughing at times, I was like, I wonder if you laugh when you write this. Um, and it sounds like you feel everything when you write it. Yeah, but you have to. It's just um, you get what you give to it, but you can't. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but it's that's the reason why like Scandinavian crime is really famous abroad. 
uh, Scandinavian crime novels are really famous. That that meant for a while because that was so commercial. Like how highbrow writers, like writers who were writing other things, would say, "Oh, anything, anyone can write a crime novel. Anyone can write that. Nah, that doesn't. No, you can't because you have to believe it. Right. It doesn't matter like technically what you're able to do. If you have two singers, one could be the best singer in the world." But if he or she doesn't believe in the song, doesn't feel the song, it doesn't matter. You'd rather listen to someone who has less of a voice, but feels everything. Because you'd rather hear it from someone on the verge of crying as they're singing it, than someone who just sings it perfectly. Because that's just, you know, that, that, that's not art. Um, art is, craft and emotion it's that that when you feel something it's not just having something perfectly executed because then you know then we can have robots for it, it then then it has to be that element of um, of surprise too and that comes from the human experience i think right that makes sense if that makes sense no it, it does make sense and i feel like that's what everyone's picking up on in the in your writing and how you, you know, people will talk about your writing and say, I'm laughing one moment and crying the next. And it's really interesting and helpful to hear you talk through um, injecting stories with emotion and, and feeling it yourself. So thank you for that answer. Um, we have another question from Scott to go back to Beartown and your answer there. Scott was asking, the idea of Beartown not ending after three books is incredibly exciting. Have you watched the HBO series yet? How does it feel to see your story brought to the screen? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I don't know. I'm, I'm writing the third part now as, as I'm feeling right now, that's potentially the end of the Bertrand saga, so to speak. Uh, I don't know, but I could, at some point, you know, find one aspect of it, or maybe I'll write something that takes place several years later or anything like that. It's always that, you know, you build a world and then I might want to come back to it. I'm not closing any doors. Uh, um, there is an HBO show. Uh, I think it premieres in October. I don't, th I don't know when it's coming out in the US. Uh, I know that HBO Europe has it for October 17th or, or whatever. Uh, and I don't know anything about like the regional, if it comes to the US or Canada or some, something like that, but, uh, but I haven't watched it. Um, uh, my, my wife handles like, because I had a little stress breakdown three years ago, uh, where everything just got too much for me. And uh, after that, she took over essentially everything that isn't writing books um she she handles the the business part the negotiation parts all of the tv movie rights uh together with our agent and they just put me on a need to know basis and, and it, you know as it turns out most of the things that's going on i really don't need to know and uh but it's working out pretty great for everyone but yeah. it's with the bear town thing it it's complex it's really it's always strange when you have th something that you wrote being adapted into something for the screen because that's what it is and that's what I keep telling other writers when we talk about it you have to remember that it's an adaptation it's never going to be your work it's an adaptation for many reasons um, some things that you write won't work on the screen but it's also that well some things that you wrote that's on only gonna, that joke is only going to be funny one, the first time around, or that turn of events is only going to be exciting when you re, maybe you have to turn it around a little bit for the screen to make people want to watch it again after read the book, and so on and so forth. But um, but in the case of Bear Town, I haven't watched it because I'm writing the third part, and I didn't want that to get in my head. And uh, uh, my wife and I have had this philosophy with uh, movie and TV. We have the same philosophy with translators of the books that we 
we work really hard to find the best people we can. We try really hard to find directors, producers who really get what I did with the story, uh, who really understand it, really comes from the same emotional starting point that I did. But as soon as we hand it over to anyone, as soon as we hand the book over to a translator, as soon as a director or producer you know, are given the rights to explore it for TV or film, we move out of the way. That's been our philosophy. We move out of the way and we try to let people do that job. Um, because I think creatively that's the only way that makes sense. Otherwise I'll, you know, I'll be in someone's ear and that's just gonna be a compromise. And I don't think that's good. We have to let them run with their vision. And that means their choice might not be my choice, but um, but I believe more in, you know, letting someone free creatively. That makes sense. You sort of answered a couple questions in one because a few people were asking about translators and your involvement with that as well. Yeah, um, part it looks, of my service. <laughs> it looks like we have time for one more question. There's a couple questions on sports here. So I wanted to get one of those yeah. in as well. Um, Linda asked, as a hockey mom, I really related to Beartown. Have you ever played hockey or soccer for Brit Marie? Or do you do a lot of research? You really nail the emotions and the lifestyle of these sports. No, I played, growing up, I think I played every sport almost, except for hockey. Uh, because I, I grew up in the south of Sweden and I know the American view of Sweden is, you know, there's polar bears everywhere, but... <laughs> um, uh, it's only like your view of Sweden, your 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 idea of Sweden. That's only like the northern part of Sweden because Sweden is a very thin country, but it's very tall. Um, it's I mean Sweden is as big as California. It's bigger than California, I think, um, and it's kind of the same shape, uh, which means the climate is really different. I mean the climate in San Francisco is really different from the climate in San Diego, and. Um, uh, I grew up in the south of Sweden, which means there, the hockey isn't as big there for natural reasons. The climate is way different. Uh, it's not Spain, but it's still, you know, it's not, it's not polar bears in the street either. But so what would happen was my, my parents worked a lot. So they, the, for me, the growing up, I could do every sport that I could get to myself. And hockey just wasn't an option because I couldn't get to the, the, the hockey rinks with all the gear. So I just never started playing hockey, but I played everything else. But that probably, I did a lot of research, a lot of research. I've never researched anything as much as I research Beartown. That's mm -hmm. why the thank you list at the end of Beartown is that it's a long, 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 long list. And that's not even a third of the names I actually, you know, Oh, well, thanks to it's uh, so I did do a lot of research, but I also had this sense going into it that maybe it was an advantage writing a hockey novel because I know so much about sports. I know so much about sports culture, about locker rooms, about, you know, the, the, the all the different emotional aspects of it. Um, so I'm an insider in that way. I write the book as an insider. But since I've never played hockey, I'm an outsider too. So I wrote it both as an insider as an outsider. And that, I think that really helped me because then I could, I, I, I could view it from everyone's perspective in a slightly different way. And maybe I, if I had been playing hockey for all of my life, maybe I couldn't have, I don't know. Yeah, you had a little distance from it. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, well, we are right up on time. I want to just a housekeeping thing. I want to just call out that um, Rob has added a few links in here for anyone who's interested, where you can buy autographed copies of the list. This is in the chat. Um, and if you want to learn more about BookBub, my company, there's a link in there as well, um, as well as to next week's um, virtual author presentation with Kyle Mills. Um, Frederick, thank you so much for your time. Truly, it's been such a pleasure. Thank to you. Talk to you. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for your wonderful book. Um, I so enjoyed it and uh, best of luck to you on the next book. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Thanks for tuning in.